So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the webinar. Uh, my name is Jim George. I am the market develop manager for our molecular products here at One Lambda. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our new next generation sequencing webinar series. Uh, the goal of this series is educational. So I'm pleased that uh, Dawn has agreed to discuss her experience with the validation of our all type FastPlex next generation sequence library assay. So as a reminder, uh, this presentation will be recorded for future viewing on the One Lambda website. And during the webinar, uh, please direct questions to our panelists um, by typing your questions into the chat box uh, on your screen. And we will uh, have a question and answer session at the end. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dawn Thomas. Uh, she joined the Cleveland Clinic Division of Research in 1989 as a research technologist and moved to Allergen Laboratory, known as the Tissue Typing Lab, uh, becoming a histocompatibility technologist in 1994. Histocompatibility technology uh, specialist in 1999, uh, DNA supervisor in 2004, and then began leading the research and development area of the lab in 2012. Serving the histocompatibility community as an accredited uh, inspector for the American Society for Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics from 1998 until present uh, has allowed Dawn to share her expertise and collaborate with peers across the country. She's an accomplished author and researcher. Dawn has contributed to over 60 manuscripts and abstracts and continues her passion for research and advancement through analysis and writing, scientific bench work, including study testing, developing new methodologies, and validating new assays. It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to our presenter, Dawn Thomas. I am Dawn Thomas of Allergen Laboratories at the Cleveland Clinic, and I am here today to share with you our experience in implementing the FastPlex NGS. HLA typing method in our laboratory. I chose to name the title of my presentation as FastPlex NGS, Frag Tag, Pool, and Go. As the key to shorter turnaround times is the method that pools the sample soonest in the process and wins the race. At Allergen Laboratories, we have validated and implemented 11 locus HLA typing you know, for all NGS, for all solid organ, and our bone marrow HLA typing since March of 2017. In March of 2018, as we decided to adopt the traditional all type NGS assay. And then as of April of 2022, we have completely switched all of our NGS testing to the FastPlex method. We four digit typing, you know, is an invaluable tool as it does deliver more accurate allele specific antibody assessments and aids in pre and post transplant monitoring of DSA. You know, it also delivers for us an accurate epitope mismatch assessment between recipients and donors. Here is shown a depiction of the simplified workflow that compares both the traditional NGS method and the FastPlex NGS method. Now, in the traditional NGS, all type workflow, the normalization of samples and all library preparation steps are you know, performed singly for each sample in a 96 well plate format with pooling you know, occurring at the very end of the process. The key differences with FastPlex are the elimination of the normalization steps of, and fragmentation and the adapter um, tagging, tagmentation now take place in one reaction as shown here. With FastPlex, the pooling occurs very early in the process, and thus all subsequent processes with library preparation can now occur in a single tube, thereby saving a significant amount of time. So here we show another depiction of how early pooling allows for single tube library preparation with the FastPlex, and thus Fast meaning fragmentation and adapter synchronized tagging um, allows for pooling early and then universal barcoding 
can take place in a single tube as well as all subsequent um, processes in the NGS testing. So also in a single tube would be library PCR and the QC analysis, and thus loading onto the instrument uh, much sooner than with the traditional all type assay. This next slide uh, shows which targets are enriched for, for NGS typing of the HLA genes. Of note, a huge enhancement is the addition of sequencing exon 1 for DR beta 1, DQ beta 1, and DP beta 1. The addition of exon 1 has significantly increased our levels of um, high resolution typing for these loci, which is beneficial for um, decreasing and thereby sometimes in some cases eliminating ambiguity in these targets. So we had to really ponder why would we switch? We already have a really good um, NGS platform in place with the traditional all type. But what we found is that as a requirement of our clinical service, we do need shorter turnaround times for both solid organ and bone marrow workups so that we can quickly result what we find in their initial workups. Uh, comprehensively, we are reporting antibody and HLA typing, and we are also able to provide stat testing as well with this new typing product, all type FastPlex. So what we show here, I highlight for you our current workflow of um, what our turnaround time would be, you know, when we um, would use all type traditional NGS versus the FastPlex. You know, our lab typically runs about three to four micro flow cells per week and a one, nano, one nano flow cell. Uh, it can vary, obviously, with the volumes. You know, we have two MySeq instruments in the laboratory also that allow for flexibility and for even higher throughput. We're able to achieve that. You know, nano flow cells we now use are, uh, for stat cases um, and for our bone marrow urgent patients. And it is now possible that we can turn results out quickly in a stat manner um, with a one-day turnaround time very easily from the start of extraction to the very next day having reportable results ready to go. Um, in our laboratory, it was a good decision, you know, to implement NGS testing for all of our initial workups of solid organ and bone marrow. FastPlex has been an invaluable tool for enabling stat testing. You know, adopting the FastPlex method we are able to achieve a much higher level of resolution. Oftentimes, more often than not, in the data we'll I will be showing you, is pretty amazing how um, you can resolve to, you know, single allele pairs at most of the loci. This slide shows how we decided to evaluate the FastPlex product or strategy for doing so. Uh, because at Allergen, we have performed the traditional all-type NGS assay for more than four years. Our strategy for, you know, evaluating this FASTPLEX, you know, was conducted on samples in parallel with our routine, you know, in our routine clinical setting. So we ran a comparison with samples tested by the standard all-type assay with the FASTPLEX assay. You know, as we already have this vast NGS experience, we felt that this parallel testing of our random daily clinical samples would be sufficient, you know, in testing this modification of um, the all type NGS system. So the product evaluation strategy, you know, has taken place in two steps. And step one uh, involved the parallel testing of 24 clinical samples, you know, using all type versus FASTPLEX. And from this testing, we evaluated first the overall concordance for all the loci between the two. Um, we then looked at uh, cis-trans detailed resolution for ambiguous pairs. And then we also looked at the allelic resolution, the differences between the two. Was it better? Was it the same? And step two of this process is ongoing. Allergens, we've made some post-validation improvements uh, to help further streamline the process, and we have continued monitoring 
of um, various metrics in the process. I'll go over those uh, optimization of testing processes, you know, that we've implemented in the lab that we felt to be you know, quite helpful. And then we also took a look at uh, the different sample types that we have coming through the lab, blood, buccal swabs, and um, you know any influences in the quality of typing uh, that may have arisen between the two or with FastPlex. And then the third part of this is that we took a retrospective look at the typing resolution, uh, created an, an assessment table of that data. Uh, because we've only been um, performing the FastPlex for a short time, probably a little over a month. It's interesting the results that we were able to compile in making this assessment. So here we show the um, typing concordance uh, between the Alltype and FastPlex NGS. As I had stated before, we tested in parallel 24 clinical samples for a micro run, uh, which including DR beta 345 would be a total of 421 alleles. Overall, 100% type of concordance was achieved in comparison. In the second assessment we performed, you know, we were comparing the cis-trans resolution. So here we looked at out of 384 alleles, excluding DR beta 345. It was interesting, I was able to further discriminate, you know, a total of 55 alleles, accounted for 14% as compared with standard, standard NGS protocol. And within this group of the 32 allele pairs of the 55, 58% of these allele pairs were resolved to a single allele pair, of which 23 of those 32 allele pairs, 72%, resulted in complete ambiguity resolution at DQ beta 1. And this is due to the inclusion of exon 1 sequencing with the fast flex typing reagents. So here is a table that shows, um, you know, due to the addition of exon 1 in this NGS platform, these specific amb ambiguities are addressed because of exon 1 interrogation. And uh, we have found that we have seen most of these, and yes, they are resolved with the fast flex Method. Here, we decided that we would perform a quality assessment of additional three field allelic resolution that was achieved by FastPlex and GS. So, of those original 55 alleles that were further discriminated, 23 of those, 42% uh, of those alleles, were able to be further defined um, at the three field level of resolution, whereas prior with the all type traditional NGS reagents, they were originally defined at the two field level of resolution. So with this assessment, we felt that we could make the switch to FastPlex and, you know, the quality metrics were really good. So we decided on this basis, we would go live and monitor, you know, constantly monitor the results and the quality of the NGS typings. So here, step two of our evaluation, you know, Allergen has made some post-validation improvements um, that were very helpful in streamlining our testing process. First off, we do all of our quantitation by a 96 well plate reader. Instead of, you know, measuring by single tube uh, qubit quantitation, it has served us well and has really streamlined the process because you can add your samples with a multi-channel pipette. Secondly, our workflow has become even further streamlined as in this assay, there are more stopping points. We find that it allows the tech to get as far as they can, as far as they want, and be able to stop at those various stages in the assay. We've been able to achieve stat testing with a nano flow cell. It can be completely done in one day, NGS, starting with extraction and uh, loading the MySeq early afternoon uh, for sequencing to occur overnight, and then you come in the next day and you have results to report immediately. So that's been very good uh, in order to serve our clinical service. Uh, thirdly, you know, we've always had our own local workbook, and we've optimized this workbook for use with the FastPlex assay. You know, our, our local workbook has served us well. You know, it helps us with reagent tracking and, you know, potential manipulation of calculations, which, you know, when you're trying to troubleshoot, it's good to really know what's going on with these calculations. 
um, for all steps in the NGS process end to end has aided with uh, troubleshooting, et cetera. So these are the improvements that Allergen has put into place to further streamline our NGS testing. We performed a post-validation assessment we have all type FASTPLEX NGS samples, uh, 403 samples. We have since going live in April, um, we have since typed 403 samples and I have fresh data to share. This slide shows, this data shows that the number of ambiguous two field allele pairs, you know, encountered by FASTPLEX thus far. And it's very low uh, for most of the low, low side and we're able to achieve most in most of our samples, a uh, single allele pair resolution. Of note, you see for DQ beta one, well, you know, in the original parallel we performed, um, we were able to show a 72% ambiguity resolution in our the alleles that were tested for in this clinical parallel. However, here we see, wow, it's a little bit high here at 18%, and at 71 of those uh, at DQ beta one showed ambiguity. Well, my answer to this is of the 71, 57 of those were due to um, a library update um, with the addition of DQ beta 103 colon 454, which is found in Exon 6. And 10 of those 71 were of homozygous DQ beta 10301 allele, which the 03276 null, you know, still comes along with it. Uh, we have criteria for when we will reflex test for in homozygous uh, typings. And then there were four others of the 71 that were of other, other allele combinations. And, you know, allele combinations play a huge role in how well you're going to um, resolve to a single, you know, allele pair. Also taking into account sequencing quality in, in the analysis and how the algorithms are applied. But overall, we see very good, you know, with this post-validation assessment, very good allele resolution. So as a part of continued monitoring, I mean, we know it's early, uh, you know, we've adopted this early and, um, you know, we're going to continue to monitor additionally the influence of sample type, you know, and the quality of DNA and um, our success with being able to obtain a high quality 11 locus NGS typing for our samples. And as a whole, just as a take home message here, you know, there has been no negative influence of sample type. Our DNA quality is very good. We have an input of genomic DNA in the range between anywhere from two nanograms per microliter to 480 nanograms per microliter. Uh, buckle swabs are, is, is, you know, not our mainstay sample. In the lab, um, we are a land that receives mostly whole bloods, but there has been no influence or negative influence, if you will, of the sample type and our DNA quality. And being able to obtain 100% successful typing results with all of the quality metrics passing. In a nutshell, this is our experience in adopting and uh, implementing FastFlex. I want to continue now in summarizing our efficiencies that we've gained with FASTPLEX. Number one, it's definitely uh, switching has a streamlined the testing process incredibly. You know, with the normalization steps being removed and pulling earlier definitely wins this race. Adopting FASTPLEX has uh, proven that there's shorter hands-on time, thereby we believe lessening the potential for human error and What's amazing about it is we're able to eliminate a potential single sample dropout, you know, loss in pooling earlier. We've seen this so many times before as you're handling these samples singly in plates and then you're like, oh, great, I have wonderful DNA. And then at the end, you have to wait to the end of the process to say, oh, oh, I lost my sample somehow, somewhere in, in the cleanup or whatever process it may be. Pooling early is key. This definitely is amenable to stat testing, starting from DNA extraction to loading a nano flow cell with and able to achieve 24 hour turnaround time. This is so critical in our bone marrow testing. You definitely are using fewer plastic consumables, pipette tips and plates, which is a plus and a savings. Additional efficiencies, 
our improvement in ambiguity resolution, you know, due to the addition of exon one, especially for DR beta one and DQ beta one, the cleanup beads are also included in this kit. And that provides, it's a very nice convenience in handling the beads within the kit instead of separately. We've had supply chain issues in the lab where sometimes we couldn't, we couldn't get the beads in. And also, too, you, you have to remember, now you have to perform a separate QC of those beads. And now that they're in the kit, that is completely eliminated um, as you QC the entire kit. And so with that, I thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. And I know you had a couple updated slides that you wanted to share with uh, individuals, and there should be on the screen now. Yes, absolutely. So good morning. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Um, I now since have even fresher data to share with this update. You know, since that time, um, since the time of the presentation, we have typed an additional 637 uh, samples in the laboratory using FastFlex NGS. Um, and so the data I'm going to share with you is um, generated from mid-June to mid-August. And so about two more months worth of data. So what we see here in this continued post-validation assessment, um, again, we are looking at the number of ambiguous two-field allele pairs um, that are generated. And we show that the data looks even better. <clears throat> um, so for the various loci, uh, HLAA, we have less than 1% two-field ambiguities, and we have for B, less than 1%. C, at 1%, we had zero uh, allele pair ambiguities at the DR beta 1 locus. And for DQ alpha 1, we have less than 1%. Uh, DP alpha 1, less than 1%. And again, if we look at DQ beta one, we see uh, similarly the same phenomenon uh, from the first cohort of data of the 403 that we analyzed. Uh, again, the, the 43 um, allele pairs at DQ beta one that show ambiguities, uh, again, are attributed to those same ambiguities that we had seen previously. Um, among those 43 DQ beta 1 ambiguous two field pairs, we saw that 14 of those, or 33%, were attributed to the DQ beta 1 0301 slash 03 colon 454 ambiguity that resides at the end of exon 6. And what we see, um, I don't want to use the word petering out, but we do see toward the end of exon six that you know you have a little bit of drop off and your um, the depth of coverage is a little bit lower. Well, here in the laboratory, we do have an established depth of coverage at 20, um, 20 bases, and go, we can go down as far as 10 bases. Now, in some cases, like say with bone marrow, um, bone marrow recipients, donors, where we see this, you know, it, it's based on analysis and the good quality metrics. Uh, we may be able to oftentimes um, resolve this and, you know, rule out the 03454. Um, the other ambiguity that we had seen um, uh, in 29 of those 43 or 67%, you know, they're attributed to the homozygous DQ beta 1 or 301, where you're bringing along the 02 the 03 colon 276 null. Um, you know, that's an unsequenced region in exon one. So it does come along. Uh, sometimes it is ruled out, but in the homozygous setting, um, it, it's also included as a part of it. So it's included as an ambiguity. Um, so next, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So as a part of this, um, we are constantly monitoring and we have seen some additional improvements, you know, in this continuous monitoring and um, in per protocol, the normal range of library concentration per protocol is um, 1.9 to 2.1 nanograms per microliter of input DNA, um, which we've been able to lower this to 1.4 nanograms per microliter of um, input DNA uh, for optimal cluster densities. We were just, you know, per the protocol, we were 
um, having pretty high cluster densities. And we knew that we could optimize this by cutting back, um, slowly cutting back and seeing <clears throat> you know, the results. So we were able to uh, achieve this optimal cluster densities you know, using the 1.4 nanograms per microliter. That being said, um, we now see that uh, we're not seeing allele imbalance. You know, we were seeing allele imbalance before. We are not consistently seeing allele imbalance. And previously, <clears throat> we had seen some allele imbalance with DR2, DR4s, excuse me, and DQ2s. Uh, oftentimes, but this continued optimization has, you know, pretty much eliminated that uh, phenomenon. So that's wonderful. Um, thirdly, you know, we're able to achieve, we've seen, you know, successful HLA typing, even at much lower uh, DNA concentrations. Um, the range has seemed to broaden, you know, we're able to be more successful, you know, that's helpful especially in your bone marrow population, where oftentimes, you know, depending on their leukemia, you know, you the blood, the test buckle swabs as well, um, to be able to um, achieve a successful typing for those patients and not have to, you know, reflex and ask for a buckle swab sample or redraw. So that's been very beneficial to us. Um, another advantage in, in what we're seeing in this continued monitoring is that we have not seen any allelic dropout. Um, it's pretty amazing. I just, uh, you know, it, we had seen some before, but um, now it just seems with all of this continuous improvement monitoring that we're, we're not seeing the allelic dropout. I think a lot also has to do with being able to, you know, lower your input DNA concentrations uh, in having the optimization of the cluster densities on the flow cell. So to add additionally, um, what we're finding is our learning curve has also narrowed, you know, in training on FastPlex, you know, in that first month when we were testing. And I think that's with any platform the lab's bringing on, you always have that learning curve when you're training. Um, we've seen that that's narrowed uh, significantly. We're able to get people up and running and trained in a week and then they're ready to go uh, to perform the assay. Um, again, you know, I had mentioned before in the recording that, um, you know, having those more stopping points, you know, is, is very nice to have that flexibility, um, getting as far as you want, or if you have something else that comes up or using those stopping points so that you can accomplish other tasks. Um, so that's been very beneficial and integral for us. So another, um, you know, I spoke with our lab coordinator, Paul, yesterday, and, um, you know, we're speaking about, you know, how we can perform stat testing. We can, on a nano, do, you know, get uh, results out in 24 hours. Still true, wonderful. What we're seeing now, and in the previous slide during the presentation, I had shown, you know, we can reach, you know, three day turnaround time, two to three, you know, even on a micro, we are seeing now with all of these optimizations and can, you know, continuous monitoring that we're hitting two day turnaround time more often, even, even with a micro run. I mean, it's just been very good and the metrics have been passing and um, we haven't really seen any more uh, issues that I could share with you, other than the fact it's been going well, and we've typed over a thousand plus samples successfully. And um, this is where we're at in our experience using FastFlex. Next slide, please. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge our laboratory. Um, our, our director is Dr. Ai Wen Zhang. And our DNA laboratory, we have Paul Kozak, our laboratory coordinator, Heather Eilrich, who's our lead technologist, Stacy Massasevic, lead technologist, Sarah Manley, lead technologist, Rachel Keiko, laboratory manager. I, I just have to add here that um, this group, we've worked together for several decades. We bring 106 years, I had to say, of HLA experience to the table, and they're a great group to work with. Don, I wanted to thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of the viewers uh, for joining us for our webinar today.
Uh, we certainly hope that you found this webinar informative and interesting. If you have any suggestions for further webinar topics, please feel free to uh, reach out to me directly at jim.george at thermofisher.com. Um, this concludes today's presentation. I want to thank everybody for joining and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.